Hello everyone, this is Seth with World of Paleoanthropology. Today we are here with a very special guest, Dr. Marina Elliott from the Rising Star team. And I'm gonna let her introduce herself a little more and we will have a great discussion today. Great, thank you so much, Seth. Yeah, as, as Seth said, my name is Marina Elliott. I'm a biological anthropologist and archeologist. I'm originally from Canada. Uh, and I spent uh, seven years in South Africa working on Homo Naledi and the Rising Star Project. I'm actually now back in Canada, um, continuing with some, some paleoanthropology research, archaeology, and a whole bunch of other projects, so we can talk about that. Mm. Um, yeah, what else do you need to know? Uh, gosh, I've had actually kind of a circuitous career um, getting to this point. I actually did... Um, some education in animal health technology. So I was a veterinary nurse for several years and I did um, some adventure tour operator driving, that kind of mm. thing. Uh, but I also um, was always a, a climber and a caver and an outdoor person. So those kind of skills actually really helped me get the job at Rising Star. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, I know um, Professor Berger was definitely looking for a very unique skill set when he first set out and I know um, you and all the others who participated in that first round were definitely a very skilled set of individuals. An elite group indeed, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, so how did it play out for you? I know that he, um, Professor Berger posted an ad on Facebook. So what happened? You're just scrolling through and you see this or like, did someone approach you? Yeah, great question. Um, what actually happened for me was that I, I woke up on a Sunday morning and was checking my email as you do. And my supervisor at the time, I was finishing my PhD in Canada. My supervisor at the time emailed me, he had seen the posting mm. and he emailed me and said, hey, you're a caver and a climber you know, <laughs> does this look interesting? And I read through it and thought, wow, that literally describes me. <laughs> and so um, I was pretty excited to apply and, you know, but I didn't know really what it involved. Um, Lee's description was, was pretty cryptic and a little <laughs> strange. Um, you know, it said, I need a few people for this potentially brief project, you know, but they need to be not claustrophobic, be able to work in a team, be reasonably small, you know, all these sort of very strange requirements. And since I fit them all, I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. And um, I don't know how many people that listen to you have, have done PhDs, but this was also at the tail end of my PhD. So I wanted basically to do anything else. Right. Uh, then finish my PhD. So, um, and that's just because the write-up is so painful. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I applied and within a few days, I got a, a message back from Lee's um, administrative people and they said, let's set up a, a Skype. Mm. And so I did a Skype. Uh, and then within a month of actually seeing the posting, I was flying into South Africa and wow. joining the field team. So yeah, it was pretty whirlwind, but really, really exciting. Yeah, I bet. Having that experience of just applying must have been just amazing. So, okay. What does Lee actually tell you? When do you find out that there's possibly a new hominid down there? Like, when does he actually tell you that? Well, um, he didn't actually know that either. Um, okay. And so when, when we were talking about the, you know, the project after we had all been selected, the six of us. Um, Lee sent us some photographs that the cavers had taken of the material that was on the surface. Obviously, they knew enough not to, to move or touch anything. Mm -hmm. um, so they had taken some, some pretty decent photos. And in fact, Lee's son had helped with some of right. that. So right. um, Lee sent us these pictures and they were, you know, they're they're typically terrible photos because <laughs> most of the material is, is covered in dirt. And so, but there was this beautifully sort of tantalizing piece of mandible that, um, you know, even with a scale, it looked, looked really quite suspicious. When Lee was talking to us about it, he said, you know, we don't know, we think maybe it's some kind of australopithecine, maybe a paranthropus. But again, even with a scale, it's really hard to tell 
you know, what that material actually is. Right. And I don't think once we actually got down into Rising Star, I was among the first group, mm -hmm. I guess I was the first scientist to get into the chamber. Um, and we started looking at the material. Our first task really was to just get a handle on how much was there to begin with. So we started just walking, walking, crawling the surface <laughs> of this very small space, flagging anything that looked like bone. So we ended up with about, I guess, almost 300 little fragments scattered across the surface. Um, and those we collected, sent up to the surface. And then we actually started the process of excavating. And I think it was probably two or three days into the actual excavations that the, the scientific team, and there, you know, this is a whole group of, of scientists and researchers that kind of amassed themselves on site to, to look at this material. Right. And so there were probably five or six senior scientists, another five or six more junior researchers, the excavators, all of us who were also researchers in anthropology or archeology span as well. And so every night we'd kind of get together and talk about what we'd found and, and what was there. And so I think probably within the first two or three days, we'd found enough material to sort of say, wow, this doesn't really look like, like what we were expecting. It's certainly not an Australopithecine, but it's not, but there's some other funny parts to it. So I think, yeah, within the first week or so, we were thinking this is something novel, um, mm -hmm. but then it took, you know, a proper couple of years of, of research and, and analysis and workshopping through it to actually come up with, with why it was different and how it was different and then, you know, come up with a name. Definitely. I mean, it's just, when I, um, when I started, my, took my first anthropology class in college, it was actually 2013. Oh, so wow. all of this was happening right as I'm in my first biological anthropology 101 class. In real time, wow. In real time, my teacher had no idea what was going on because unfortunately so many teachers are so in the past of what's going on. Um, so I explained to her and she like freaked out and then we followed it together. And I'm just like, this is amazing. Like this is, I've been hooked ever since. Like it's That's just great. So going back to Hona Letty, um, it's my current understanding. There's about 1600 fragments now or something around there. Well, actually, um, if we do the grand total, I think we're up around probably closer to 2000 oh, wow. okay. um, fragments from the Dinaletti chamber. And right. then there's another, the you know, chamber. six or 800 from the Lissetti chamber, which mm -hmm. is a second area in the same system. Um, and so, you know, that that's, that's starting to be a pretty massive collection now. And I think yeah. we're between the two locate, you know, between the two localities, I think we're looking at, um, 28 or 29 mm -hmm. individuals all told now too. Wow. That is just amazing. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I assume there's been survey, geological surveys and other things done, but is there any chance of finding a third cavern or anything else? Or has that all been checked? Yeah, no, that's that's actually been that was part of a, a major focus of what I was doing in South Africa when when I was there um, was, you know, we were concentrating on some of the excavations in Lissetti and the Dinaletti chamber. But one of the things that we also really wanted to know was how much more there might be in the system itself and the Rising Star cave system. You know, we I think in the end, our cavers um, ended up mapping maybe three to four kilometers of passages in, in the system itself. And there's lots that, you know, they weren't able to get into or they're just so small, but we have identified a number of deposits that, that are potentially also Homonoleti, um, some of them quite close to the Dinaletti chamber in what we call the Dinaletti subsystem. Mm -hmm. um, because there's kind of, you know, like any labyrinth, there's sort of right. interconnected spaces, but they're not necessarily nicely connected. Um, so we do have some additional deposits of what might be Homonoleti, and we need to actually do the, the actual research and analysis for that. Um, we still only have these two main deposits where we, we for sure have, have Naledi material. And then the, the greater cave system does actually have other uh, 
material in it, faunal mm-hmm. material, other bones, okay. even, you know, the remnants of, of extant species. So, mm-hmm. you know, living baboons or, or the odd jackal that, that gets into the cave and gets misplaced. Um, but in the, in the two areas, Lissetti chamber and Dinaletti chamber, there really isn't a lot else other than the Homonoleti materials. So um, at least associated in that, in that area. So it's, it's still pretty intriguing. Yeah, so it definitely sounds like Rising Star is not done giving up its secrets. Oh, heavens no. No, even, <laughs> even if you just look at, at one of those two chambers, the Dinaletti chamber, the Lissetti chamber, we're nowhere near, um, you know, excavating those areas, you know, fully. Um, that, that'll be years and years of work. Yeah. That is just, that makes me so happy because that means <laughs> yeah, I can get there one day and work on it. Um, yeah, it's going to be an intergenerational thing as well. Oh, for so, sure. Yeah, lots, for sure. Lots of potential. Um, okay. So what, obviously you are, excavations are continuing as you mentioned, but what, what have we learned about Homo naledi besides the fact that it's a new species? Like, what if, what does the uh, archaeological evidence show us? Yeah, there's there's a whole lot of really interesting aspects about the Homo naledi discovery, and you know the the volume of material that we just discussed is you know was quite mm. amazing, particularly for a paleoanthropology excavation that you know that concentration and volume of material is quite unusual um the fact that we had so many individuals in in that very small space and i think that's something that that often gets kind of missed in in some of the the papers and and even the media about hominoletti is that in those two first excavations in 2013 and early 2014 we had brought out whatever it was 1500 uh, hominin fragments but all of that came from a single excavation unit 80 centimeters by 80 centimeters by 20 centimeters deep and that's you oh. know about the size of a child's sandbox and so to have that kind of concentration of bone material in one in one area is really uncommon and then of course there's the the aspect of the anatomy hominoleti is quite unusual it's a real mosaic of of features it's got some aspects that are are quite uh, ancestral looking look very much like an Australopithecine or some of the older species, but then other aspects look very much more similar to to Homo and, and later species. Mm-hmm. So there's a really interesting combination there. But then we have this problem of all of this material and all of these individuals being in this very remote space in the cave, which of course in itself you know, we had all kinds of speculation as to how this material got in there, why there were so many individuals in this difficult place, why it was so hard for us to get in there, and, you know, would it have been that hard for Homo naledi? Um, and so we really spent a lot of time on, on that question because it's a big deal. Um, right, definitely. You know, had this, had this accumulation, had this assemblage been anatomically modern humans, I think there would have been no question in anyone's mind that it was a, a burial situation or a, even what they call funeral caching. Right. So a, an area where, where the population was deliberately disposing of, of this material. But because Homo naledi really doesn't look like us, um, I think that gave people a lot of pause. But in the end, we actually couldn't find another explanation for the deposit other than a deliberate act on the part of, of Homo naledi as a species to bring its dead into these spaces. And that has raised, of course, all kinds of questions about, you know, what that means in terms of behavior, what that means in terms of, of cognition, what that means uh, in terms of the, the sort of the evolution of, of the treatment of the dead, of our understanding of, of death, and in fact, what it means to be human, and how, how we like to think. So um, that's just opened a whole can of, of worms in terms of, you know, how do we understand burial, and how do we understand the concept of death, and, and what is it about us that separates us from other species in terms of that understanding. And so I think Homo naledi is really exciting that way because instead of sort of saying, okay, we found this new species, we're done, we're dusted, kind of let's go. Um, it's actually raised more questions and that's, that's good for anyone who wants a career in paleoanthropology. <laughs> um, 
but it's just it's super exciting because it's not just about the anatomy i think right. sometimes certainly for for paleoanthropologists you know sometimes the context is not that clear a lot of east african material is is kind of found out of context you know ex situ as they say you know it's mm -hmm. it's kind of tumbling out of a a you know a hillside or something and so the context isn't as as important mm -hmm. but in homonoletti's case the context is is critically important and so right. it draws on a lot of of archaeology theory in terms of trying to understand that and i think that's really really crucial definitely now correct me if i'm wrong and this could of course have just changed with the discovery of the um or rediscovery of the harbin skull um there is supposedly a fourth um ghost DNA in our sequences, mm -hmm. what are the chances or is there any thought that it could be Homo naledi considering the time range? Wow, uh, excellent question. You know, it's it's possible, but I, I am very much an, an evidence-based scientist. <laughs> so, uh -huh. you know, possibilities are one thing, having evidence for something is another. So right. at this point, we, we don't have any evidence. Mm -hmm. To, to say one way or another, um, but we certainly know, what we do know is that in, in modern human DNA, we have some representation, depending on what group you're looking at, in terms of Neanderthal. I'm in the 99th percentile for Neanderthal DNA, something I'm quite proud of, um, <laughs> but we have, you know, we have representation of Neanderthal DNA, we have elements of Denisovan DNA, we have other elements, and we have these, these ghost genes that, that really are just big question marks for us mm -hmm. in terms of, of where those came from and, and how they came to be in our genetic material. So, um, you know, there's there's lots and lots of interesting questions and, and the DNA analyses may get at them eventually. I think it's certainly intriguing. We may never know um, how those relate. We have tried to get DNA out of uh, Dinaletti and Lissetti several, well, not Lissetti just yet, but we have tried to get DNA out of Homo Naledi a couple of times now without success. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's partly because the the sediments and the moisture in in the Dinaledi chamber are just you know not conducive to the preservation of DNA. Um, but that's not to say that there won't be new techniques further down the line that that might recover DNA or that might mm -hmm. give us an opportunity. Even some of the newer techniques in terms of, of trying to extract DNA from surrounding sediments right. are really promising. And so I think, you know, it's, it's certainly a matter of time and we just need to keep, keep on it and keep thinking about, okay, how can we get at this information? And maybe we'll discover the relationship eventually, or maybe not. And, you know, that, that may just have to be how it is. Right, definitely, as so many things are in this field. Yeah, indeed. So changing topics a little bit, I know that you are being featured in a new book that is coming out that was put out by National Geographic for Kids. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, let me see, did I, do I have it at hand quickly? No, I don't. I think it's, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> It's it's being borrowed at the moment. Um, yeah, this this is a really a really lovely project. I was very very grateful and and honored to be included in it. It's it's called Girls Can, and it's a, a National Geographic book for for children, boys and girls. Um, but it's it's basically a, a a collection of of sort of biographies of of important women who have done really amazing stuff. Um, and there are some incredible women featured in this in this book. And it's really just a way to kind of reinforce for girls of all ages and boys that there are are multiple ways to to sort of do things and that, you know, um, there are all kinds of people that are doing really interesting things in really interesting ways. And should you have a passion that you can become one of them. So it's um it's just a you know a nice sort of girl empowerment book but i think it's also important for for boys and for adults to sort of recognize that that these things as as modern and as progressive as we like to think we are that these things still kind of need to be said and need to Definitely. be showcased 
and um, you know, I'm I'm involved in a lot of of girls and and women in STEM initiatives, mm-hmm. and one of the the kind of expressions that's been going around lately is if you can see it, you can be it. And that's really important in part because if you if you don't see role models among, you know, if you if you never see a female scientist or you never see a person of color in a position of authority, if you never see, you know, that in advertising or in film or in in your world, then it's really hard to put yourself into that position. Oh, a kitty. <laughs> um, I was trying to avoid so, that, but uh. yeah, that's, <laughs> mine is wandering around as well. Um, so it's, but it's really important for, for people of all ages to, to see that, that if you want to be something, the important part is, is going after it and, and, you know, pursuing that goal and that there shouldn't be and we know there are, you know, systemic barriers to mm-hmm. to doing that. But one of the ways to, to kind of address those barriers is to say, look, you know, we actually need to talk about this. We need to to show children, and we need to show adults who have children that mm-hmm. these are possible, and that you should encourage, you know, girls and boys and and society generally to to address these issues and actually talk about them and say. You know, if you if you can see it and you want to be it, go for it. And I think that's really important. I agree. I think that is crucial and something that is so sadly lacking in today's uh, society because there, I see and hear so many times that people, you know, like you said, if they don't see that role model, where would they get the idea that they could be it? Exactly. So. You know, I mean, I know that it is a huge uh, player in the game. So, yeah. And even just, you know, for myself as as a woman, you know, I was always, I was always very sporty, always a tomboy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, that was very, that worked for me. Um, But even, you know, once, once Rising Star was sort of very much in the media, you know, there was a lot of focus put on oh you know these these six women and that's that's so crazy that you know they I'm like why why should that be crazy why should that be a surprise to people yeah you know and but the fact that it was still a a topic of conversation for me meant that clearly we haven't done enough work to normalize the fact that that as a woman I would be doing not just um, really important scientific work, but that that scientific work wasn't sort of specific to a nice clean lab, that mm-hmm. I get dirty, I get bloody, I get, you know, stuck in these strange spaces. And that's, that's all part of being a good scientist and a researcher. And that that term, in fact, runs the gamut of those who, who work in the classroom, those who work in a lab, and those of us who who like and enjoy doing the the dirty work out into the out in the field. And and all of that is really important for people to see. Definitely, 100 percent Now um, you also have another book that you've published with Professor Berger. Yep. Um, I'm trying to recall the Guide to the Cradle of Humankind or something. Yeah, yeah. Handbook okay. to the Cradle of Humankind. Yeah, um, and that one, let's see, no, nope, don't have it. I should have very nicely to get these out. Um, that one's a little bit, obviously, more, more specialized to that region. The right. Cradle of Humankind is, is an area in South Africa, just um, northwest of Johannesburg, about an hour away, um, that is, is not, it's, a, it's been designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but a lot of the land is sort of multi-use. So um, it's, it's a designated area because there are so many fossil sites in that region that have, have really contributed to our understanding of, of human evolution and our, our past. And so there's probably 15 or 16 um, different fossil hominin localities in that region. And so there's just a wealth of knowledge, not just about human history, but about the Earth's history as well. It, because South Africa is a, is a really crucial area in terms of understanding all of the geology and, and the past of, of the earth and all kinds of other species. Um, the, the cradle of humankind is really this 
quite brilliant microcosm of, of our collective past. And so um, Dr. Berger, Professor Berger had, had published a similar guide many years ago, and mm. it was originally designed as a sort of as a workbook for guides who do um, tourism and, and interpret interpretation in this area for, for tourists. Um, but when I joined the team in 2014, um, Lee said, well, you know, maybe we should revamp this, especially since there are so many new discoveries that have been made. And so we worked very hard to get this into a sort of a usable format. But then mm -hmm. I also wanted to have it be something that that was a resource for anyone who was interested in that area. Um, and and so it's it's available on Amazon. And it's yeah, it's a good, very regional um, sort of guide to to that area. But if you if you're into your your South African paleoanthropology, it's a great read and and it's a good resource if for anyone who actually wants to visit that area and see some of the sites. Not all of them are open to the public, but there are some that you can go and visit. And it's a great, you know, sort of uh, primer for that if you end up ever getting to South Africa, which is beautiful. Definitely. Um, so what is next? What is next? That's an excellent question. Well, I'm in Canada for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, COVID has been has been very hard on on lots mm -hmm. of, of industries and, and businesses. Um, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I mean, South Africa was very, very good to me. I'm, I'm hoping now to continue with research while I'm in Canada. Um, I'm now sort of officially affiliated with Simon Fraser University that's in British Columbia. Um, but I'm, I'm living in Calgary in part to, to take care of my mom who's on her own now. So there's, there's always, you know, and, and this is something I think to, to bear in mind, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the science and the research, um, but all scientists and researchers have, have lives as well. And sometimes, you know, there are, there are other pressures and other responsibilities involved. So um, I am, I'm part-time researching with Simon Fraser University and we're working on a number of different projects. I'm continuing to do research on, on Homo naledi as many researchers do with, with material just that's already been excavated. Um, and we're, we're actually looking at um, some projects that involve the caves in Canada and the US. And so um, a lot of people will know that both Canada and the US are, are riddled with caves and mm -hmm. um, and many of them are really important in terms of understanding things like the peopling of the new world in terms of you know understanding the movements and interactions of past people in North America sort of the, the timing of, of when people entered and how they entered and what route they took all of those sorts of things and then in terms of, of the archaeology of North America there's um, you know, aspects of, of burial, aspects of, of cave art that are really important in North America. And so there's all these aspects of, of caves that are really quite crucial. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the important things for me, both working in South Africa and, and being a caver, and then also working um, in some other places. I've been to Arapuerca, for example, in mm. Spain, where Cima de los Cuesos is a very important right. cave site. And just starting to think about um, the use of caves in terms of, of sort of a more global approach to, to understanding how hominins and humans interact with those spaces, what they're doing in those, you know, how they're using them, and maybe that there are, are patterns and, and processes to that. So um, there's a lot of, of potential, I think, to continue to do research globally. Um, and as, you know, any number of, of more recent finds have have reinforced um you know paleoanthropology is a is a really busy field right now and there are are lots of cave sites that feature quite prominently in those discoveries um so there's there's lots of opportunities for for people in if you are interested in paleoanthropology and if you happen to have you know expertise in in caving as well there that's kind of a bonus but there's i think um it's a great time to be involved in this science and um there's certainly a whole lot happening. So yeah, it's pretty Definitely. exciting. Uh, so what advice would you share to any students or early research professors who would like to just 
delve in more or start their journeys? Yeah, you know, for me, one of the the things that I do like to reinforce is just is getting a, a broad base of experience. You know, I, I came to anthropology later in life, um, having done a number of other things, you know, some of which were just because I, I had those, those interests, things like caving and climbing, I just did recreationally. Um, but also, you know, I had done a number of, you know, my, my veterinary experience actually helped me in terms of anatomy and physiology. Um, my outdoor experience and, and some of my um, guiding experience helped me in terms of leading a team, in terms of managing people, in terms of understanding risks, for example, when we were going underground um, and trying to mitigate those. So I think it's really important to, yes, if you have a, a passion and you, you want to follow it, that's awesome, but don't don't kind of sweat the fact that you may not necessarily know what you want to do right away and that, you know, you might, you might follow a more, a more varied path and that you might try, try other things and, and do something else. You never know how something like waiting tables as a summer job might actually give you some skills that you can use later on in terms of just working with people and understanding you know, how to manage your time, for example, or just giving you the, you know, some, some aspect of, of later life that will help you. So, um, yeah, I guess I would say don't, don't worry if you don't know what you want to do just yet. Um, try a bunch of different things, experiment with, with all kinds of stuff, take a class, do something that, that you don't think you will like, but you never know if you haven't tried it. Um, so yeah, just, just get out there and, and give it a go. I think that is some great advice. Uh, going back to Rising Star, just because it is literally one of my favorite things. <laughs> Something I can't wrap my head around, and I've been in cave systems before, nothing fancy, just like touristy. Sure. Um, I don't know if you've heard of it, but like Cave of the Winds in Colorado. And yes, like, of course, like, yep places like that um so no we're serious but the idea to me of going down into a cave and being literally in the earth I mean what does that feel like like when you were the first one down there in that cavern and there was no one else there was nothing else going on it was you and homo Naledi. what did that feel like that you know it it is something that is really difficult to describe to anyone who who hasn't sort of been in mm. that space. And it it really is something special. Um, I recognized that, you know, what we were doing in in Rising Star was unique. I mean, it it is a, an unusual environment. It's it's not everyone's daily commute. Mm -hmm. um, and so and certainly that that first time that I went into the Dinaletti chamber, um, you know, you're, it's dark for one thing. And so you only see what your headlamp shows you. So there's, there's that aspect, which is, is quite interesting. And I, I urge everyone to just, you know, try and find the darkest room you can and, and use a flashlight and just see what that's like. It really changes your perspective on things. Um, and then of course it's, it's humid. Um, Rising Star stays at about um, 18 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but it's, it's almost at hundred percent humidity. It's at 99 oh, wow. humidity. So it's, it's a bit sticky. So it's, it's sort of damp and warm and, and a little bit musty from, from all the, the earth and the rock around you. But I actually find it, um, very comforting and very, uh, yeah, very sort of secure. I don't, I, mm -hmm. I am not one of those people that get claustrophobic, of course, okay. um, or I wouldn't have been able to do this job. But, um, you know, unlike many people, I think I find that that closeness. Um, yeah, I find it securing rather than mm -hmm. than anxiety inducing. Uh, no, that's not to say that when you get stuck, that that's very comfortable. <laughs> but um, Fortunately, I have not been stuck very often and I have not been stuck in Rising Star. So, um, but it's, yeah, it's a very special feeling and it's certainly compounded when you realize that, that what you're doing has additional importance in terms of, of a scientific discovery. 
um, that that aspect of it is is really special. Um, the the cave itself is is wonderful and and you know as a as a caver it it's really cool. But to to add on to that, the fact that that we were doing something very important in terms of our scientific understanding of our past and that it it has become and will continue to be really relevant to to our understanding of of just our collective past i think is is pretty special and a real honor so right. that's that's pretty pretty interesting amazing so i actually thought that um for some reason uh, i don't recall anyone ever mentioning it but i assumed that rising star was a dry cave has the humidity what role has the humidity played in preserving the fossils yeah i mean i guess technically it it is a dry cave it's not there there's only like one area where there's there's sort of any standing water uh -huh. uh, but it is obvious that the water table uh has risen and, and fallen within the system in the past um, at the moment, you know, we don't have to deal with with very much water other than the, the atmospheric humidity, um, which is nice. But um, yeah, I think the, the moisture contributed to the degradation of the DNA, certainly. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the moisture has also, I think, contributed to the fact that when we were excavating the material, the bones were, were quite fragile. So unlike a lot of, of fossil context, certainly um, paleoanthropology in South Africa, most people sort of imagine it like, um, like the Tong child or some of the other, Mrs. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people have heard of those, but those are like, are more like dinosaur material in that they're fully fossilized. They're, they have basically turned to stone. Right. Or they're, or they're encased in a concrete of, of sort of, um, rock and conglomerate called breccia mm. and hominoleti is not like that it's it's in soft sediments in rising star and we use like wooden toothpicks and paint brushes to to expose the bone but once we've done that the bone is really fragile it's it's um it's quite delicate and and not quite spongy but it's it's almost soft because of that moisture and so when we're collecting it we have to be very very careful and then once it gets to the lab you have to dry it out very, very slowly and try to, you know, put it back together as, as carefully as possible. And so there's obviously a bunch of techniques to do that. But I think the moisture um, certainly contributed to the DNA degradation and has contributed to the, you know, just to the, the fragility of the bones. And then, of right. course, makes it just a little bit sticky to work in. But <laughs> so. Um... I've heard uh, Lee talk about this a little bit. So what we know obviously is that Homo naledi in Rising Star is something like 250, 300,000 years old. But that of course is only those specimens. Homo naledi could have emerged 2 million years ago. People don't know. So how, have there been any clues to maybe where Homo naledi fits in the braided stream or do we still not know where yeah, does that fit in? that's that's a great question um and again one that we may not ever answer mm -hmm. um and certainly i think one of the important things that homonoleti reinforced and and you know this has been i think has has been an idea that's been around for a while but maybe doesn't always filter out into the sort of the larger imaginings of these things but I think you know Homonoleti's appearance and the fact that that doesn't or didn't really match very well with its its time frame for that population um, really you know gave people pause but we have lots of other examples in the in the greater zoological world of that we have you know we have crocodiles we have coelacanths we have you know all sorts of species whose living populations look almost indistinguishable from their sometimes million year old um, progenitors. And so, you know, the fact that we now have hominins, and in fact, Homo naledi is not the only one, we have uh, Homo floresiensis in mm -hmm. Indonesia, who also is a, a very, you know, archaic looking population that lived into relatively recent times, 
and so we have this sort of pattern starting to show us that that maybe you know hominins actually you know followed a pattern like many other species on the planet in terms of there being taxa that that were very old but that maintained living populations much more recently than than we maybe thought they might have um, and that's super interesting and so then it actually for me opens up a different set of questions you know why is homo naledi look weird is not that interesting it's why is homo naledi look like that and still around at the mm -hmm. time it is and and why do we have now these couple of species maybe even another one homo luzonensis mm -hmm. that all seem to to show this pattern of being kind of small bodied kind of archaic looking but potentially more recently you know around and and what does that mean what is that pattern showing us and what what are the commonalities in those species that might help us answer those questions so um yeah it i think it just it asks a different set of questions which for me are more interesting right perfect uh so when we're talking about Homo naledi still, of course. Um, what is, so there are current excavations going on still, right? Well, not in, not in Rising Star per okay. se. Um, the, the team is working in some other areas. Mm -hmm. um, if you follow Lee's, Lee's yeah. group, there's another area called 105, yeah, right, 105 that they've been working on, which is another cave context, but it's it's more open than than Dinaletti or Lissetti. And so it's it's not quite so difficult and onerous to get into. So it's it's much easier to work in. And that's where they've been concentrating most recently. Okay. Um, and in fact, they're continuing to do um, explorations and, and surveys of, of the cradle generally. Um, all that kind of information is is quite important in order to understand you know, the sites are very interesting, but there's also the broader context of, of where these sites occur and, and how they fit into all the other sites. You know, we have Sturkfontein, we have Swartkrans, we have Gondolin, we have all these sites in this same area. And again, looking at kind of the bigger picture of them and, and where they fit into the timeline and what species are, are included in those localities um, is all part of sort of understanding the landscape of, of hominin evolution, not just, you know, looking at, at one individual species or one individual site. So um, the team is continuing to work, not in Rising Star per se at the moment, but in 105. And I, I believe that they're they're starting to work in some of the other uh, sites in the area. Gladys Vale is another one mm -hmm. that um, Lee worked many years ago that I think they're, they're considering opening up again. Um, mm -hmm. Malapa, where Australopithecus sediba was found, right. has continued to to yield material, and I think that's you know ongoing. Um, but there's just there's actually more work than we have people to do <laughs> the work. So um, yeah, get your degrees and get out there. <laughs> that is definitely the goal. <laughs> um, so going talking about the 105 site for a moment, and I don't know how much you can share but, or how much you might actually even know about it. But yeah. um, I know they found a few molars and possibly, I don't remember exactly what they found, but I know they found a few molars and they seemed large, mm -hmm. like very large. Yeah, and I think, um, I think Lee's been, been reasonably open about that. Um, now that, you know, the, the molars were found, um, a little while ago, I mean, not not this year. They were found actually during some of the Rising Star material, mm -hmm. and so they, as far as I know, have not been sort of properly analyzed and described yet. So that's presumably in progress. But one of the the big challenges in 105 is that, like some of the other sites, Sturkfontein, Swartkrans, this material in 105 is in that brecciated conglomerate. Mm -hmm. So it's in it's in it's sort of encased in stone. Um, and so what the team has been doing is kind of pulling out um, loose blocks of this material and, and kind of scrutinizing them for 
little telltale pieces of bone, or in the case of the molars, those were a little bit more exposed. But then the next step is to actually try and, and release those bones or those teeth from the matrix that surrounds them. That is very, very slow work and involves, you know, tiny little dental picks and pneumatic tools. And that, that is just really slow going work. So that, that's ongoing. Um, and the, you know, just pulling out that material and, and going over these blocks to try and find any little pieces of bone, that's all ongoing. And then, you know, along with all of that, you have to then document the space Every. itself. So you have to record where all these blocks come from. You have to try and figure out if they've fallen from somewhere, you have to try and figure out where they've come from um, and just documenting the cave itself as well um, takes a tremendous amount of work. So as far as I know, all of that is still ongoing. Um, and the team is, is literally sort of grinding away at that. And um, yeah, and hopefully we'll get some, some published results on those pretty soon. But, you know, all of that takes time. Right, definitely. I am very much looking forward to seeing those uh, mm -hmm. journals and articles when they come out, though. Uh, wait, so is there anything you would like to express or share with the people listening and just to um, inform you, the people listening are a wide range of individuals from students to teachers to professors. So what would you tell them about the field right now and where it stands and what we collectively as a species, why it's important we study paleoanthropology? You know, that, that's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, you know, I said earlier that it's, it's a really great time to be in this discipline, and I, I think it is. It's, um, you know, there are new techniques that are, are helping us, you know, revisit material that, you know, that has been quite old or, you know, hasn't been looked at with, with fresh eyes or with new techniques or whatever. And then there's all these new discoveries that are being made. And you know, I think, I think that is tremendously exciting. And so rather than kind of thinking that that age of exploration is dead and gone and there's nothing new to find, I think it is important to, to reinforce that there are, there are brand new sites, brand new fossils, brand new species out there waiting for us to find, but that there's also tremendous value in revisiting old collections, um, you know, finding stuff down wells that have been lying there <laughs> since 1930. You know, there's there's a tremendous amount of, of potential in, in revisiting uh, old collections, looking at them with new techniques, just looking at them with, with fresh eyes and new, and new data sets. We have all this new information. And so revisiting those collections, I think is, is really important. And just always going back and, and sort of reinterrogating our methods and our and our assumptions about what we know I think is really important. But then as far as as why paleoanthropology is relevant um, to us today, I think one thing for me that's really critical is that paleoanthropology is really the the study of of us, uh, you know, in the broad sense of humans um, on a on a very deep and and important scale. So this is this is family history writ large. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's, you know, interested in their, in their family history because they like to know, you know, why they have, you know, why they have a ski jump nose or why they have blue eyes or why they, you know, have a funny laugh or whatever it is. And this is, is sort of looking at our family on a big scale in deep time. And certainly, you know, right now when it kind of feels like, like we're, the world is becoming more divisive and more kind of conflict oriented. I think it's important to remember and focus on the things that we share and the commonalities that we have rather than the differences. So I think that's for me, what makes paleoanthropology relevant even today is, mm -hmm. is looking at and asking questions about what we share, what we understand about who we are, why we do things, and where we come from and that for me is is really important we all we all sort of want i think fundamentally to know you know who we are and where we came from and 
paleoanthropology attempts to answer those questions on, on a much bigger scale. So for me, that's, that's relevant to all of us. And, and that means also that, that anyone from, you know, a teacher to a plumber to a, you know, to a, a cook, um, it's relevant to them because it's, it's relevant to all of us as humans. So I think um, engaging with the public as we are doing today, uh, regardless of, of your background or your expertise, is really important and and just to try and help people understand you know what it is that we do and and why it's of interest and why it, they can be interested in it you don't have to be a scientist to understand this material and you don't have to be a scientist to engage with it and ask interesting questions um, and i think that's really important um, even rocket science isn't rocket science we need to be able to explain it to you know to the average person and right. and have them understand it and and ask good questions about it and that's how we learn <laughs> <laughs> she oh just what a sweetie <laughs> <laughs> what's her name um, yeah i think that is a wonderful answer and i think it really is a wise answer that rings very true and you know like you said, the connectedness between us is so much stronger and more important than the differences that we may face in our daily or in our extended lives. But if we can't come together at that base level of we're all human, we see what happens. There's wars, there's famine, there's, you know, it's... Yeah, and I think also understanding that that we are just one species on a planet that's been around for rather a while and that yeah. you know we share much more in common with all of those other species than mm -hmm. than we think i you know i certainly believe that and that as as this big brained quite egotistical species um it's kind of our responsibility to you know to do something about that mm -hmm. we've we've made a mess of a lot of things um, but we also, I think, have the potential certainly to consider how to mitigate some of that and how to, how to correct it if we can. And, and so I think that's something that in terms of kind of the philosophy of science and, and some of the bigger questions that disciplines like paleoanthropology raise is that it gets us back to thinking, okay, so if we're, if we're looking at what it is to be human, great. But what, it is, what is it to be a responsible human? What is it to be part of a society, a community, a, a planet? And what can we do to actually try to do that well? Um, I think those are, are pretty interesting questions too. Not necessarily answerable, but interesting questions. <laughs> well, with that, I think... Um...